testified on me that she said she was going to do. Inside joke. She said she was going to leave when she found out I was preaching. But, she, but Kyle had the keys, so she couldn't leave. It may be a good thing. She's she liable to get saved tonight. <laughs> but anyway, my name's Aaron Kirkland. I'm one of the assistant pastors here at the harbor, and I want to tell you tonight how excited I am that you chose to come out because I believe I have a word for it tonight, and I'm not only preaching to you tonight, I'm preaching to myself because he's really burnt me up on this one. And uh, like I said, I burnt some midnight oil in the early mornings and long walks. So how many of us believe that you know, today we have filtered the word so much to fit in the society that we removed a lot of its truth. And I believe real power is when you teach and you preach the word in its entirety. How many tonight want the gospel and it's going to be unfiltered? Unfiltered. Because you ain't going to grow with me up here blowing a bunch of smoke. So tonight I believe the Lord's got a word for us. He's got one. So if you would, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to teach tonight out of Psalms 37. If you got your word, it's verse number 23. It says this. It says, the steps of the man, the steps of a good man, ordered by the Lord. He delights in his ways. That right there by itself is a good place to thank the Lord. But here's where it gets even better. It says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Is there anybody here that's fallen before? But you got back up. And you realize, hey, you got back up because you didn't get up on your own because it says right here, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So tonight, we're going to talk about those steps. The steps. Embracing your steps is what we're going to talk about tonight. That's where I want to teach at. So if you would stretch your hands forward because this service belongs to him anyway. It ain't nothing about me. It's all about him. Father, we enter your presence. Thank you. For this night, for this day, these people that are here, Father, I just thank you for your word. Father, you got bottled up. And Father, I thank you for what you're about to do in this service. Father, I just thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, enlighten us with your wisdom and your knowledge, Lord. Take these lips of clay, make them yours. Father, give us the anointing like never before. So, Lord, I thank you for each person that's here, Lord, that you just take their heart and open it. Lord, they leave here knowing the steps, Lord, that you've ordered is the ones, Lord, they need to embrace and run with. And, Father, we will always be careful to give you all praise, glory, and all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now I got that off to the side. All right, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And you see, I'm glad about that. And he delights in his ways. This text is written by the legendary king, David. The author of this psalm He's no spring chicken by the time that he writes this text. You know, he's got a few miles on him. And he's at the end of his reign. Gone are the days of killing giants. Gone are the great military campaigns. All of that's behind him. He's a... Gone are the days of killing Goliath and fighting those big battles. All that's behind him. He don't have the physical strength anymore. He's at that stage in his life to where his greatest weapon, you know, is not a spear, not a sword, and it's not a sling. But his greatest weapon is his experience. His experience. Because he's at that stage in his life where it ain't a spear no more. It's not that sword. But his greatest weapon is the stuff that he's already been through. It's the times that God has already done the things in his life. It's the battles that he's already won. It's the times that God has seen through ways that there was no way out of it. There was times when he should have been coming down that the Lord picked him up. There were times when he should have been going down. There's been times when he should have died, but he made it through. And here he is. He's at his old age, and he says, The best thing I have going for me is my experience. Knowing this, that God had done it before. If he'd done it before, it means... He can do it again. He made a way one time, he'll make a way again. If David was standing here tonight, he would probably tell you, the things that I panicked over in my 20s, I praise over in my 60s. The things that I wanted to quit over in my 30s, you know, I danced over in my 70s. 
Is there anybody here that feels like your strength is not necessarily in your wisdom? It's not necessarily what you got to offer. It's not always what you can bring to the table. But the greatest weapon is looking back on what God has already brought you through. You can stand up tonight. If I gave you the opportunity, you can say, hey, God did it before. You see, he can do it again. He made a way before he can do it again. You see, I may not be strong as some here tonight. But you know what? I know where my weapon is. It's in my experience. It's a beautiful thing when your weapons are your experience because you're able to lean back and look at the things that God has already done and brought you through. You see, David has already now survived the giants. He's already made it through family failures, family coups. You know, he's, he's already made it through that journey, and that journey's taught him a thing or two. It's just like us. The journey should teach us. You know, right now I'm not as hard on people as I used to be. Used to be I was hard on people. But the journey, it's all because of the journey. David had arrived. He has survived. He has arrived. He, like I said, tonight I want to jump right into this revelation about embracing your steps. Because it's all about your steps. You know, this right here was a critical time in David's life where he was trying to make that deposit into that next generation. He was trying to make sure there was something of him that was left for that generation. So he sits down and he pins these words, the steps of a good man. What kind of man was he talking about? He's talking about a good man. Tonight I want to take this text and I want to take it apart a little bit. You know, it's human nature to love the destination. You see, we love the blessings. We love to get where we're going. We like to see what the promise is, but we just don't care too much about the process. We like to obtain what God's promised, but we don't want to go through anything to get what we want. See, it's like Joseph. The Lord showed him the palace, but he didn't show him the process. The Lord will oftentimes show you the end of a thing before he shows you the process. Because if Joseph had seen the process, he would have never made it to the palace. He probably would have quit. He would have quit. And like Joseph, we got to embrace our steps. We got to embrace them. Many people resist that process. Many people want success and money. They just don't want to go to work. They don't want to work. Many people who feel called the opportunity in ministry. They want ministry success. They want opportunities. They want open doors. They just don't want to prepare. They don't want to go through that process. Many men are looking for a good wife, but they're not committed to being that good husband. They want to be a sorry man, but they want a good wife. And there's women out there that want to act like a hoochie, but yet they want a good husband. Man, they got quiet in here, didn't they? Huh? Many people want to lose weight and get healthy. They just don't want to give up the pizza, the pretzels, the Popeyes, red velvet cake, chocolate cake. You see, they want to lose weight, but they're steady eating lasagna. You're trying to cut down and lose weight, but you've got to understand what David understood. Life is a series of steps. The Asian David now says the steps, the steps of a good man, are ordered by the Lord. And see, David could say this at this time, because he was at a time in his life where he realized things didn't happen to him overnight. You know, he just didn't land in the place where he was at. It was 15 years from the time God, that Samuel came to him and anointed him till he became the king of Israel. So he took that crown, so he took his place. See, I want you to get this. You'll get the anointment before you get the appointment. You see, God will anoint you to do a thing. Then he'll put you on the hold and work with you. And get you ready. You see, God has your blessing already in place. God has your victory already in place. The question is not, does God have a plan for victory in your life? The question is, are you willing to embrace the steps? God's already got the victory in place. But are you willing to embrace the process? God's already got the victory in place. All kind of breakthroughs, miracles are on the horizon for you. Are you willing to embrace the steps? Your blessings are already in place. Somebody say, the steps. Man, y'all weak. Steps. Yeah. There we go, there we go. Y'all weak. Hey, the more y'all participate, the shorter it's going to get. The word steps there, the phrase, the steps, it means the process, the goings. Somebody say the process. Yeah. There we go. Hey, y'all learn. Y'all went out here early, don't I? I can see. 
But see, God, I want you to hear me in the room. God is ready. Get ready because God's already prepared your future right now. Your blessings are in place. You see, when God said it, it already was. God isn't working on it. It's already done. When God declared it, it was. When God spoke it, it already was. You see, he has your future already worked out. He doesn't have to get up and work on it. He ain't got to sweat about it. It's already done. Your blessings are already in place. When he declared it, it is. There's some things that you're going to have to step into that's already prepared. It's already there. He's already got it ready. It's already done. Some of you are here tonight and you're wondering why. If he's already got it done, why do I got to go through the process? Why is God requiring steps for me? Why in the world is there a process to a promise that he's already got? If it's already there, if my breakthrough is already secure, why am I going through the process? Why am I going through? You see, I'd rather not go through that process. You see, there's so many people that want that escalator. You know, they don't want to take no steps. They'd rather ride the escalator up the steps. Just let me ride the steps. Don't take me through the process. I don't need the process. Why in the world does the Lord require steps anyway? Why? I'm glad y'all asked me. Y'all ready for an answer? Yeah, I don't think y'all ready. I'm glad you asked. God requires steps for this reason. Through the process of steps. You see, God ain't working on the blessing. The blessing's already done. You see, he's taking this time to work on you. That's the process. He's working on you. He's working on you because your blessings are already in place. There's so many wanting the Lord to move, but you're standing idle. You're idle. God isn't going, God isn't getting the blessings together. He already has the blessings together. God isn't getting your breakthrough together. It's already there. He's already got it together. He isn't putting your season together. It's already done. He isn't putting your victory in place. Your victory is already in place. God isn't opening a door. The door is already there. He ain't working on anything. He's working on you. He's working on us. He's working on me. I don't know about you, but he's working on me. He's working on me. You see, we live in a time where many want God's gifts and they want God's presence, but they don't want his path. When I say they want his presence, I spell that P R. E-S-E-N-T-S. They want his gift. They want his presence. They don't want his path, and they don't want his process. You see, I've come a long way in 51 years. I don't think like I used to anymore. I've come to realize process is part of the blessing. Because the time you get the blessing after going through the process, you can't help but to give God praise for what he's done. You know, don't ever ask God to guide your steps. If you're not willing to move your feet. If you're not willing to do what he wants. If you're not willing to do what he says do. If you want to move into your blessing. You want to experience your blessing. It's going to require you to embrace the steps. You're going to have to embrace them. Look to your neighbor and say, hey, embrace the steps. You're going to have to embrace them. Because if you believe God has a blessing. He's got a breakthrough already prepared for you and you're going to stumble into it, then you're going to have to walk into it. That's the process. If you believe it's taking you somewhere, maybe you're not where you want to be, but, but you know God has got some things before you. He's got some things in front of you. Go ahead. Give him a little bit of praise. Make a little bit of noise. Man, y'all are weak. Man. You know, oftentimes the level of your praise is indicative. It's indicative of what you're expecting. Some of y'all are, are acting like a bump on the stump. Maybe you're not expecting much. But let me talk to the folks who have a vision. The ones who believe. You know, God's got a plan in front of you. Let's give him some praise. If you believe God's got something in store for you. Because he does. He's got something for you. But the process. The process is the biggest thing that we struggle with. We struggle with the process. The process is what tries to bring us down. It's in that time of process that discouragement tries to hunt us down. It's in the process that discouragement, depression, they start coming sniffing around. There are people in the room right now, secretly, you're dealing with discouragement. You've been hiding it. 
behind your cosmetics. Maybe you're hiding it behind your makeup. You've been hiding discouragement. Maybe with your nice shoes, your fake smile, and maybe your hollow laughter. But the reality is this. Weariness has tried to overwhelm you in the process. The steps have gotten intense. Seasons of discouragement come after us all. It gets us all. I don't care who you are. Discouragement will find you. You see, it'll find you in a penthouse just as fast as it'll find you in a poorhouse. It'll get on the bus with you just as fast as it'll get into a Bentley with you. Discouragement is hunting you down. You know, we see these people, we think they really got it going on. In a matter of time, you realize, hey, everybody deals with it. Everybody battles it. They, some people do it better than others. They do it privately, but it happens. We've got to learn to embrace the process because if we don't, we're going to be trapped. We're going to be trapped where we are. We're going to be trapped by discouragement, doubt, and fear. But you've got to learn to embrace the steps. So the first thing David said here, he said, the steps. Now watch this. He said the steps. The steps are not just any man. I'm ready to get real with you. So I want you to go ahead and look under your seat maybe and pull out the helmet. Fasten your seatbelt because it's going to get rough. We got to learn to embrace the process. We can't be trapped. Right now, the filter is going to come off for about the next 15 minutes, maybe. I might, I might go that long. So go ahead, like I said, buckle it up, put your helmet on. He didn't say the steps of any man. What kind of man is David talking about? He's talking about a good man. Somebody say good man. All right? What is a good man? A good man. A good man is defined as a noble warrior. A good warrior. One who wars for a cause. It's a good man or a woman morally. It's a good man or woman who has their priorities in order. It's a man or woman who understands what it is to fight for. What's important. It's a man or woman who understands moral conviction, moral constitution. It's a man or woman who desires what is right. And yes, I'm going to say this word. Holy. It's a man or woman who's committed to holiness. It's young people, young adults that are committed to holiness. That's a good man. Now listen. Hear me in the room. God will order only the steps of those who are committed to holiness. God's not going to order your steps if you want to go your own way. Some are mad right now because you stepped outside God's will. And God didn't have nothing to do with the steps that you were walking. He didn't have nothing to do with them. Don't shout me down because it's preaching good. But he ain't. God only orders holy steps. Holy steps. You see, we're the ones that have a destiny, but he calls us to holiness. Nowadays, you very hear very little about holiness. You know, I know some, some of you probably right now, you're cringing in your seats. In today's church, you don't hear it enough about holiness. But welcome to the harbor. Because tonight I make no apology. I'm not ashamed to tell you the truth. You know, it's all about good old clean living. I say good old clean living. Today we are so embraced with so much compromise. But tonight I've come here to tell you the truth. It's still wise to walk holy before the Lord. And letting this book, His Word, be your guideline. You see, in the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Pharaoh. How many of y'all remember Pharaoh? Right? Pharaoh. How many seen Ten Commandments? That's Pharaoh. In the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Pharaoh. He was the leader of Egypt. Israel at this time was in bondage. So Moses was raised up. God raised up Moses. So Moses goes up to Pharaoh and he says, Hey, let my people go. Let them go. Pharaoh's response was, hey, Mo, listen, listen. You can worship God right where you are. You can stay in bondage right here. You can still worship God. You can stay enslaved and still worship God. You can stay in chains, still worship God. You see, you can stay messed up and still worship God. Just go ahead and worship God, but I want you to stay where you are. I want you to stay in bondage. And today, 
the devil says the same thing. You see, Moses was wise enough to refuse. The devil is constantly pulling people into what the old timers used to call worldliness. See, now we're getting real. Now the rubber's meeting the road. Worldliness. It talks about being lovers of the world. The word world there in the Greek is cosmos. It means pattern after the world. He's constantly drawing people into worldliness. Listen to the lies that the devil tells people every day. You can still go to church. You can still worship. You can even lift your hands. You can even shout when the preacher says shout. You can still be religious. You just don't have to leave the bondage. He's constantly telling people, hey, you can sleep with whoever you want to. You can have sex with whoever you want to. Man, they got quiet already. No amen on that. All right. If it feels good, do it. You can still go to church. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can compromise. You can stay in the world. You don't need to come out. Just come out on Sunday. But on Monday, hey, come back in. Then on Friday, hey, you can step into the club. Man, it's getting quiet. It's okay to step out on your wife. It's no big deal. You see, God understands. No, he don't. Listen to me. God ain't cool with that. Not at all. He's not. He don't understand. Hear me in the room. The devil tells people all the time, you can worship God on Sunday. Just stay in the world. No need to change your lifestyle. No need to change the things that you do. You can live and behave any old way you want. Just stay in the world and worship God. Where are our pastors? Where are our leaders? Especially the young ministers. Who's going to rise up and tell people, hey, God still can transition and transform your life. You see, there's a God that can still make a difference. He can make you different than what you are. There's still a God that gives you power to walk straight in a crooked, perverse world. There's still a God who will help you say no to drugs. There's still a God that gives power to do what is right. You see, we need to adjust. You see, there's a lot of people that, you know, they don't want to adjust their lifestyle. You see, they say they got it all figured out. You don't have to really change, Pastor. You can stay in the world and worship God. You can do what you want. What do you got to say about that? Well, I say this. Religiously, you can worship God religiously. You can stay right where you are as it relates to your lifestyle, your activity, and you just go through those religious rituals of worshiping God. You can be a religious worshiper, but listen to me. God only commits himself to ordering the steps of people who are in pursuit of goodness and holiness. God commits himself to order steps of those who are committed to holiness. You see, you can't walk contrary to what God's got to say in his word. God's will and then expect. See, a lot of people think they can walk and do any old thing, and as long as they pay 10% of their tithes, God's going to just open up the windows of heaven and pour it out. But he's not, he don't work that way. He's not going to bless anybody that walks contrary to his word. So right now, if it's just too much for you, go ahead. Break out your phone. You can get on Facebook. You can do whatever. But hey, I'm fitting to finish this thing. You cannot walk contrary to the word of God and then ask him to bless you, to give you favor somewhere. Somewhere. I said somewhere. We got to say, I'm not going to stay in Egypt. I'm not going to stay in bondage anymore. I don't want to be bound by drug addiction. I don't want to be married for the fifth time and headed to divorce court next month. You see, that's not me. That's not me. I want something in my life that's going to set me free. Free from the works of the enemy so I can rejoice with the steps of the righteous that are ordered by the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, it says this. It says, therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. You see, I want to come out of Egypt. I want to come out. I'm not trying to stand up here tonight and be ugly, be hard, and be that Bible-thumping preacher that gives you no hope. That's not me. But I'm telling you tonight, me, I want to come out of Egypt. I want to walk joyfully in the freedom that God has for me because that's our job. That's our assignment is to make the world thirsty for what we have. How are we going to make them thirsty for what we have if we act exactly the same as they do? 
If you're as jacked up as they are, if you're as bound up as they are, if you're as messed up as they are, why are they going to want what, you are, what they already got? They already got what you got. But when they see you walking in freedom, when they see your liberty, when they see you walk in the blessings and the favor of the Lord, when they see every step that you take, God's hand is on your life. How many tonight want to make the world thirsty for Jesus? You know, he's transformed your life. If that's you, make a little noise in the place. Hey, look to your neighbor. Hey, look to your neighbor. Hey, if you're going to sit by me, guess what? You're going to get thirsty. You're going to get thirsty for the Lord if you sit by me. You hang out with me, you're going to get thirsty for Jesus. That's how it should be. You see, God can make a way. People who don't understand your praise sometimes are the people that don't really know you. They don't know your story. You say, I want to stay thirsty. I want, I want somebody to look at my life and realize, hey, I want what that guy's got. I want what he has. I hope I'm not boring you tonight. But see, there's two things that I see in the church today. Two extremes when it comes to compromise. There's two. So if you're religious, I'm going to mess you up if you're religious. Period of legalism. You know, there was a time growing up when everything you did was wrong. You couldn't do anything. Everything you did would send you to hell. You know, if it made you grand, it had to be a sin. had to be. You know, if your sister got her ears pierced, man, you think she got the mark of the beast or something. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't even have cards in the house. You couldn't play rummy. You couldn't play 21. You couldn't even play go fish. You know, see, that's what legalists do. People who are legalists, they hold people out of church. They're very critical. They've arrived around keeping certain rules. They act a certain way. They want you to act like they act. They want you to do what they do. And people who are full of legalism are usually people that are very judgmental. They're critical. They're critical of people who struggle. Can I say this to you? You see, when you come to this church, when you come through those doors, we're not critical of anybody who struggles. We don't care if you've got issues because we've all stumbled. We're not here to judge you and tell you that God can't redeem you. If you sit here tonight and you get critical because somebody don't look like you, act like you, smell like you, they're not the same color as you, not your denomination. They don't have your background. They don't look as nice as you look. Maybe you have forgotten what the Lord has brought you out of. Maybe it's because you've forgotten that day that he reached down and he picked you up out of the miry clay. Maybe you forgot about that. Because when you really understand, when you really understand how good God is and how good he's been to you, then that's when you're going to realize, that's when you're going to say, hey, I don't care where you come from. Come on in. You see, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. You see, legalistic people, they keep score of their legalistic lifestyle. They try to outdo each other. They're very religious. You see, every church has them. Every church has those religious serfs. That's what I call them, religious serfs in the church. They're legalistic. Look to your neighbor. I want you to say, hey, don't get it bent. Listen, don't get it bent. We're all here because of one thing. It's called grace. Grace is what got us all here. Listen, we love you. We love you. We don't want you to leave here the same way that you came. You can't do it. Now, here's the other extreme. Liberalism. Liberalism. It says I'm free to do whatever I want. Man looks on the outside, Pastor. You see, God looks at the heart. How many of y'all have ever heard that? You see, you're carnal if you believe that. If you believe that, you're carnal. You can't live like hell and say God is looking at your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, your life is going to be led. Whatever's in your heart, listen, if you're a pervert in your heart, you're going to be a pervert right out here. That's the truth. I hear people say this all the time, and I cringe when they say it. Only God can judge me. Do you realize what you just said? You better think again. You better take a deep breath and get some oxygen to your brain. Because the reality to it all is this. God's going to judge us all. And how's he going to do it? 
He's going to judge us by His Word. His Word. Anybody who doesn't accept Christ and live by the Word. You see, we live our lives by the Word. Not by some denomination. Not by how we feel. But we live it by His Word. You see, we got legalism. We got liberalism. It's about time we allow a holy God to form real convictions that transform us from the inside out. We got to avoid both of these extremes. We got to live a life that's balanced. It's got to be a balanced life. So in closing, I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. It says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Somebody say the word ordered. Ordered. Ordered means set up. In the original text, it means directed, fixed right, prepared, set up for accomplishment. You see, we try so hard to get God to bless our steps that He hasn't ordered. We try so hard to get God to bless them. Now listen, I want to leave, you to leave here tonight with this. What, whatever God orders, if He orders your steps, guess what? He's committed to blessing you. If He orders your steps and you're walking in the steps that He ordered, He's committed to to your steps. He's committed to it. If God sends you on that journey and you don't understand it, guess what? At the end of the journey, you're going to be blessed. All you got to do is look at the book of Job. He got double for his trouble. Double for the trouble. Bless. Repeat after me. My steps are ordered by the Lord. He has success. Not failure in mind for me. So you might want to hang out with me. You might want to stay close to me. Because that's where we're at. So if you would, I want you to stand to your feet. I, tonight, I hope you got something out of it because I preached to myself. I did. I preached to myself tonight. Tonight, I share with you what was on my heart. I know Miss Ramona is glad to see her son home. I see him all smiling. Air Force must have been good to you. Oh, that's the other one. Lights, lights. I'm sorry, lights. But I know he's home, doing. He? He's still out there. Anyway, hey, stretch your hands forward. I want to walk in his steps because his steps are ordered. Forget what, like I said, he is committed to the steps that he has you for. Father, I ask you tonight, take each person here, Lord, just guide their steps. Lord, overshadow them, protect them.